chapter 10. So hopefully you brought a Bible with you today. If not, you'll see most of the passages that I'm going to use right here uh, in the crosswalk notes. So grab those out of your program as well. That'll help you to follow along in this message. We'll be starting at Mark chapter 10, verse 17. You know, people are amazing. For example, I'll just use one example. Let's see if you can sort of guess who this is, although many of you, this is going to be too, you're going to be too young for this because the guy that I'm going to be talking about is one of the world's most famous people, but he's also 75 years old. So I'm not sure if all of you uh, will be aware of this guy. He has a personal fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars. In his home country, he is so famous that where he grew up has been designated as a special preserve by the British National Trust. And he's been knighted by the Queen of England. This is how big this guy is. He's the most successful songwriter in history. All right, those of you that are my age, anyone want to guess yet? Woo, I heard his name. Paul McCartney is the guy. And my wife told me you wouldn't be able to guess. That's awesome. You are right, it's Paul McCartney. Now think about all that success. Think about it for just a moment. Just dwell on all that success. Could you ever imagine that a guy like Paul McCartney would ever feel insecure about anything? With all that wealth, with all that success, one of the original four Beatles? Do you all know who the Beatles are? I love it when I get up here and I give one of my 1960s examples and Julie's going, "Mm, I don't know if they're going to get it. (laughs) In an article in the Australian Herald uh, in the early 2000s, they wrote, they interviewed Paul McCartney and they dug down into something that they had heard was happening, that he was in a battle with John Lennon's wife, Yoko Ono. And you know what that battle was? The battle was over whose name would go first in the credits of the songs that they had written together. Whose name would be listed first? And they're like, really? You're going to have this? You, Paul McCartney, the most prolific, successful songwriter in the history of the world, a knight of the realm, are going to argue about whether John Lennon's name goes first and yours goes second or yours goes first and his goes second. Now listen to his answer. Why does it matter? Because I'm human. And humans are insecure. See, Paul McCartney knew something, I think, about all of us. It probably helped him be a great songwriter. And that is, it's a reality of our life as sinful people It's a reality of our life in a fallen world, being fallen people ourselves, that no matter how many marks we can make on the personal scorecard, we still end up being insecure at the end of the day. And the reason I bring this up is because there was a young man hundreds and hundreds of years ago who approached Jesus And he too was afflicted with insecurity despite the fact that by all outward appearances, he was an extremely successful young man. And so I want to dive us into the first passage that's on your crosswalk notes, Mark 10, 17, if you've got your Bibles open. And this is what it says. As Jesus started on his way... A man, and if you, if you want to, you, can, you could write an insecure man, because that's what we're going to see here. An insecure man ran up to Jesus and fell on his knees before him. 
Picture that in your mind for just a moment. This is a guy that so wants to meet Jesus, despite all his successes, that he runs to catch up to Jesus, and when he does catch him and get Jesus to turn around and pay attention to him, what's the first thing he does? He gets down on his knees before Jesus, and then he says, good teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's interesting, isn't it? That this guy has had, as we're going to find out, all kinds of success. He's a man of great character. So much so that when in just a moment Jesus says, you know the commandments, this, this young man is going to say, I know them, and I've fulfilled them ever since I was a little boy. Jesus is going to challenge him a little bit further, and the problem that's going to be brought forward in our Bible text for this morning of why he can't quite get over the hump and follow Jesus is he's got too much wealth built up. He's been successful, and yet something is still driving him at this point to book it to Jesus grab Jesus, get down on his knees and say, Jesus, I, I still don't feel secure. I feel like there's still more for me to do. I feel like I need you to be my guru and help me understand how I can really feel safe and secure. And so he approaches Jesus. And he approaches Jesus through a paradigm that is not unusual at all. And by paradigm, I mean just a normal pattern of thinking. In this man's paradigm, in this man's normal pattern of thinking, he sees Jesus as a religious leader. I used the word guru a moment ago. And here's the problem with thinking of Jesus as a religious leader. It's that word religion. That word religion, if you go back to its original Latin meaning, that's where it comes from, it, it's, a, it's a word that means an obligation. It's a word that literally was used to talk about bonds that tie a person up. And in the Middle Age, it became a word that was used for putting yourself under monastic vows. Do you see the question he asked Jesus? If I want to follow you, what are my obligations? If I want to follow you, how are you going to tie me up with ropes so that I'm bound? What vows do I have to fulfill if I want to follow you? You see the question there. Good teacher, what must I do? Will you circle that word, do? We used this concept several weeks ago. Mentally, for this guy, there was a scorecard. And he's sitting there going, I got to fill it in with my score. I, I, I just got back from visiting my grandkids, and they have a board game that they love. It's called Ticket to Ride. Has anybody ever played Ticket to Ride? All around the edge is the scorecard. And you have to count. Every time you build your train tracks, you're trying to, to score points and get your train tracks to cross the nation, east to west or north to south or smaller routes. And every time you build one of your train track routes, you get to score yourself. And that mentality of having a scorecard is built into humans who are fallen, sinful humans. And that's why we feel insecure, because not knowing exactly what allows us to tally the points makes you feel insecure. I, I was playing it for one of the first times with my grandkids. And they're just moving the little icon around the edge of the board like 
like not, no one's business, and I'm falling behind. And I'm like, are you guys sure you're scoring this right? Because I didn't really understand how the scorecard worked. That's this guy. He's, he's coming up to Jesus, and he's saying, tell me how the scorecard works, Jesus. I want you to write this down. Here's the problem with that. Leading with what must I do is religion. But the problem with that is Jesus is not looking for religion. He is looking for reliance. He's looking for faith. He's looking for us to say, how can you help me, Jesus? How can I just lean into you and rest in all that you've done and stop worrying about what I need to do? So there's a huge problem from the very beginning because of this guy's paradigm. And I'm bringing this out because I'm telling you, this paradigm is very common. Because we all feel insecure. And we want to know how to feel more secure. And our mind immediately drifts to, how can I get a better score? Maybe if I'm more successful at my business. Maybe if my family is solid. Maybe if I have enough in the bank. Maybe if I'm perfectly healthy because I work out and I eat right. You see, we all have the scorecards. And what Jesus is saying is, stop, that's the wrong question. Because <laughs> any question with me and a scorecard involved in it, that's mutually exclusive. That is religion, not reliance. So we go on. Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. You see, Jesus got to challenge this scorecard mentality, this doing mentality, because think about even to the Old Testament. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That is, rely on me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So Jesus, he's got to challenge this. Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good. Except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. So where does Jesus start? He says, well, let's take a look at that scorecard. How are you doing? In all the categories that that God has given. And here's the interesting thing about that scorecard. When you go down the path of God's laws, God's rules, and trying to fulfill those, at some point, you're just going to be exhausted. At some point, you're going to go, man, this, it's just not possible. Especially if I follow what Jesus says when he says, it's not just outward actions. Nor is it just words, but it's even the thoughts of my heart that God counts. And so Jesus starts ticking this off, and he, and he starts even before that by saying, let's take that word good that you used. Now, sometimes people say, is Jesus saying that I'm not good? That's not what he's saying. He's, he's saying to this young man, who thinks that he's good, as we're going to see in just a moment, you can't be good. And the reason you can't be good is that we know that only God is good in the sense of being morally perfect, in the sense of always acting to benefit and love others rather than benefit and love yourself. Only God is good in the sense of being able to focus outward instead of always looking within ourselves and saying, I'm the center of the universe. Only God can do that. You see, even religion, what must I do? Do you hear the ego there? What must I do? Not what have you done, Jesus, but what must I do? Everything is about ego. So Jesus is trying to break that down. But listen to what the young man says. Teacher, he declared, 
all these I have kept since I was a boy. This young man probably was a man of very high character. Probably was a man who sincerely loved God's laws and wanted to do his level best to follow them. And yet, his obedience led him down a false path. Remember the story of the prodigal son? The one who asks for, asks for his inheritance and then runs off and squanders it? Do you remember that there are two sons in that story? And do you remember what the second son did? The second son stayed home and faithfully served his father, which sounds awesome and great until you get to the end of the story. And at the end of the story, you discover there are two prodigal sons, not one. Because the prodigal son who frivoled away all the money comes back in repentance and asks for forgiveness, and the father welcomes him in grace, which is how our father in heaven is. And that only ticks off the older obedient son because he thinks the way this young man thinks. Father, look what I have done. And it, that attitude, that paradigm, that scorecard mentality begins to come between him and the father because he's religious, he's good, and he doesn't realize that his father is not looking for him to have a perfect scorecard. His father is looking for him to rely on him in faith for his love and his grace. I love what it says next. Remember, this series is the one Jesus loved. You might think this would frustrate the bejeebers out of Jesus, that, 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 that Jesus would hear this guy, all these things I've done since I was a little boy, and just look at him and want to smack him across the face. <laughs> really? You've done all this, actions, words, and thoughts since you were a boy? Shut up. <laughs> That's how I would have reacted. <laughs> Jesus reacts beautifully. Look what it says. Jesus looked at him and, circle that word, did what? Loved him. Loved him. Okay. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. All right, brother. <laughs> we went through down all the, the check boxes on the scorecard and you're doing awesome so far. Like, <laughs> look at that, that check box about not murdering. Yep, you haven't done that. Not committing adultery, you've been pure sexually. Check that one. You're not going to steal, and you haven't. Beautiful. You're not lying, gossiping, giving false testimony, not cheating people. Oh, there's one more box. This is the reliance box. This is no longer how you treat other people. This is your relationship with God. Do you fully lean on God for everything in your life? And I mean fully. So fully do you rely on God's love for you that you would do what my other disciples have already done. When I went to them on the Sea of Galilee and said, come follow me, they left their nets behind, their fishing business behind. They left it all, and they came and followed me. I want you to do the same. I'm not asking for really any more than I've asked all these other guys. Matthew, he was a tax collector, was making pretty good coin. Left the tax collecting booth behind and came and followed me. Why don't you do that? At this... The man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Where 
was his reliance? Where was his confidence? How, how did he get over his insecurities? Well, he checked his bank balance. And if the bank balance was good, he felt secure. If the bank balance wasn't good, in fact, if he were to empty out the bank balance and give it away, he knew he would feel very, very insecure even if he was following Jesus who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And so he went away sad. Will you write this down? Here's the right question, not what must I do. Here's, here's the right question. In love, Jesus shows us we must ask a different question. Can anything be done with me? And this heart that wants to rely on everything but God, can anything be done so that I can give my scorecard away and receive Jesus' scorecard? You see, here's the, here's the issue with us. When we feel insecure, what that causes us to do is a lot of striving for achievements and accomplishments. And it causes us to strive again for possessions and wealth because accomplishments, achievements, wealth, how do they make you feel? They make you feel more safe and secure. Jesus says, hand that scorecard over to me. Hand it over right now. Stop looking at it. Stop thinking about it. Give that scorecard to me. And the young man says, I, I, I can't do it. I've gotten so used to my whole pattern of thinking, my whole paradigm of life is wrapped around my scorecard that I am doing things with and I am filling out and it gives me a sense of power and control and authority over my life and I feel like I know where I stand when I have the scorecard that says, here's what I must do. Do you know how big the self-help industry is in the United States of America right now? I want you to listen to that word, self-help. You hear the word ego in there? Because you should. $13 billion a year, up from $11 billion just a few years ago. You see, that's why this is so important for us to hear this story, because we still are in the scorecard mode 2,000 years later. We still are in the self help mode 2,000 years later, and Jesus is saying to us, no, don't ask what must I do. Ask honestly as you look at the commandments and as you look at the scorecard that you have, instead come to this conclusion, if he's really talking about my actions and my thoughts and my words, every one of them, every thought that flits across my mind, my first thought is, is there anything that can be done to save me? Because who knows me and the reality of me better than me, other than God? And so this is where Jesus is trying to lead this guy, but now he has a lesson from this guy for the rest of the disciples. Jesus looked around, said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. You see, a very simple illustration of this is achievements, accomplishments, wealth, whatever you want to call it, if your hands, like the, this guy's, this young man's hands, picture them clenched around his wealth. Like, no, you're not, no, no, Jesus, don't ask me to give up my wealth. Tightly clenched. How do you grab hold of Jesus with hands that look like this? You, you got no, like this guy's not only got his hands clenched, he, he's wealthy, so he's like, like this with all of his wealth. How do you take hold of Jesus when the hands and the arms of your, of your heart are like this, clenched around what you imagine is the right thing for the scorecard? There's no 
place for Jesus. And that's why Jesus says, it's so tough for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. <sighs> Dare I say it? I don't know if we have one unwealthy person in this room. I don't know all your situations, but I lived in Africa for 14 years. I've actually seen people not have enough for today and not know where they're gonna get enough to feed their babies for the next month. Not know where it's gonna come from. Have no clue. And still have to try to make life happen. When Jesus says how tough it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, please don't say, oh, he's talking about Joe Schmo over there. He's talking about all of us who have been given so much in a country where we can get work. I'm not saying people haven't gone through tough times in this room. I personally know people who've gone through extremely tough times in this room. And maybe you're there right now. But I'm telling you, Jesus is talking to the vast majority of us right now when he says how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, here, here it is. <laughs> Who then can be saved? Can anything be done, Jesus? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. You see, Jesus has said, be on your watch against all kinds of greed, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And now Jesus goes after this young man and he says, life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. And he goes after his disciples and says, I know you've left all to follow me, but remember, life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. Life, real life consists in leaning back into me and relying on me. Turn, turn the page. The answer to the question, can something be done? Is there any way? The answer is, of course there's a way. Something has been done. Jesus, the Son of God, was sent to the cross to redeem you, to buy you back from sin and death, to assure you of eternal life as a perfectly free gift from God. Something has been done. Because this is God we're talking about. And God loves you. You are the disciple whom Jesus loved. Every one of you. John calls himself that as Jonathan said earlier. But as the apostle John calls himself that. He's really saying to all of us, I'm just modeling for y'all. I know I'm the one Jesus loved, but all you should know you're the one Jesus loved. Because he does love you. That's grace. That's kind of love that we don't have to do one little thing to earn or deserve. That's God's love. God loves not because you are lovable, but because he is love. He embodies love. The picture of Jesus really ought to be in the dictionary right next to the word love. That's how fully Jesus and love go together. But, of course, we have to get to that point by the Holy Spirit's power where we lean into that grace and that love. 
You know the song Amazing Grace? It's so popular. It's got to be the most popular hymn of all times. And if you know the story at all of the author, the, com- the composer of that hymn, is, his name is John Newton. He was orphaned at a very young age, seven years old, when his mother died. And his dad was this hard scrabble sailor who went on long journeys. He still had his dad, but only part time. Then at 11 years old, his dad said, I'm not leaving you here home alone. I'm taking you with me when I go out sailing. So at 11, he started learning how to be a sailor. Have you ever heard the expression, that guy cusses like a sailor? Well, John Newton didn't just learn how to cuss like a sailor. He learned how to live like a sailor from 11 years old. Part of what he did was in the slave trade. And he, began, he became used to that until one day he himself got captured in Africa and sold to be a slave to an African princess who horribly mistreated him. When his father, who was not with him on that journey, heard what had happened to John, didn't know exactly where he was, he hired another captain to go find his son and rescue him. Through a lot of stuff that eventually happened, John Newton was put on a boat back to England, and while they were sailing back to England, just a little bit offshore near Ireland, the boat got involved in a huge storm and started to sink. It actually got a hole in it. John Newton, young man by this time, starts to pray, and the cargo miraculously shifts and fills that hole. And in that moment, John Newton goes, I am, I am saved by grace. I do, the life I've lived, to have God love me, I can't even fathom that. And yet, it's clear he does because he heard my prayer, he answered my prayer, he saved me. From that day forward, John Newton began to read his Bible daily. And he came to be so convinced that he could rely on God, rely on God's love, lean into that, know that God loved him not because of who he was or what he had done or what his scorecard looked like, but love him because God is love and God is filled with grace. You see, that's what God's grace does for you too. It fills those massive leaking holes in your life. It saves you, it rescues you, it leads you back to Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, the one that you can rely on and lean into. And that's what Jesus is hoping, that's what Jesus is hoping the disciples will do even though this young man is not yet ready to do it. Then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in the present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But understand that this love of God, this grace, is a topsy-turvy kind of love. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Disciples, where are you going to put your reliance? I know. Peter just said it. You've left all to follow me. That's a good beginning. But let me tell you, you haven't even begun to experience the fullness of my undeserved love, my grace for you. Like, I'm going to keep pouring blessings out on you. And yes, there will be persecutions in life too, but you are going to know my love, my solid, steady, faithful love daily. I'm going to reward you for things you don't even deserve to be rewarded for. I want you to think about this. Jesus is promising them rewards for following them. It's clear. You won't fail to receive 100 times as much in this present age. 
homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields. Jesus is promising rewards. But I want to take you to another passage. A passage that says, it is God who works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So I want you to think about this for a moment. You were created as an act of God's grace. Then, because of sin, you were alienated from God. Christ was sent to redeem you. Another act of grace. Then, because God knew that you're spiritually dead, he sent his Holy Spirit to enter your heart and draw you in faith to God to accept this beautiful set of gifts, a third act of grace. Then, it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good pleasure. You're now a believer, but you're, you're saying to yourself, how can I be more like Jesus? I can't. I'm powerless. Okay, here's some more Holy Spirit for you. I'll help you to want to and to actually act the way, I, the way that's going to be a blessing for you. Fourth level of grace. And then, for all of that, as a free gift, after I've done all these things to show my love and my grace, you're going to go to heaven one day because you're freely forgiven of all your sins through Jesus' blood. Do you see how grace works? This is why it's called grace upon grace in the Bible. That God just loves you and he keeps on giving. And even rewards you for things that you and I, we really ought to say, <laughs> God, no. That's way too over the top. But he won't take no for an answer because he loves you. Write this down. Grace is a topsy-turvy concept. And when the Holy Spirit helps us get it, get grace, it's life and eternity altering. Now, I want to say this, because it's important that you understand a little bit more about John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace. You might think that John Newton walked off that boat when it finally safely settled into an English harbor and his life immediately changed overnight. You might think that, but it would be completely untrue. In fact, it was decades later before John Newton wrote a letter that ended up being distributed to the parliament everywhere else to say we need to end this slavery thing. Decades later. In fact, John Newton continued to be a slave trader even after he was converted to Christ. His paradigm hadn't yet fully changed. And he still continued to do things that he had developed habits and patterns of doing before. Here's why it's important for you to hear this. As you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you may want to set up an unrealistic expectation for yourself. I am a believer in Jesus, and now that I have this new paradigm based on leaning into Jesus' grace and his love, that changes everything for me overnight. And I'm going to tell you, maybe, but kind of unlikely, that the pattern of most Christ followers is that your conversion to faith and your baptism is nothing but a beginning. That once your sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus and the waters of baptism, you've taken an initial step, but you have many steps to go as you start to deploy this new paradigm. Now, it is life and eternity changing, but the way the Holy Spirit works typically is that there's going to be time involved. Take a look at these last two passages. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. This is Paul talking. You may have heard of Paul's conversion story. And now he's saying, now that I know Christ, I still have troubles. 
Jesus even said, in this world, you will have trouble. But I see them differently now. I have a different paradigm. These light, momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So, so Paul wrote these words the day after his conversion on the road to Damascus, right? No. He might have been able to say that conceptually the day after his conversion, I don't know. But these words where he's saying, I see my troubles in a completely new light now because of following Jesus. These were years, this, this was written years and years later. As that new paradigm of living and relying on God's grace had its time to seep down into his heart and get drawn up into his mind and then slowly but surely began to emanate out through his eyes and his ears and his hands and his feet. And I'm telling you this because this is what's going to happen to you if you stay following Jesus. You're going to start to see your troubles in a whole new light because you're going to see them through the, the eyes of the grace of God. Same thing for our treasures. Take a look at the next passage. But since you excel in everything, same book, by the way, 2 Corinthians, but since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's really saying, he's really saying, you're not just going to see your troubles in a new light, you're going to see your treasures in a new light too. Because every time you look at your treasures, you're going to be reminded of your true treasure, which is Jesus. In fact, we're going to sing a song about that in just a moment where our true treasure is. And that's what Paul is saying is, remember your true treasure, for you know the grace, the undeserved love of your Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Write this down. Grace will have us looking at our troubles and our treasures in a completely different light. Do you want to be secure? I mean, truly, deeply feel safe right down to the root of your heart. Throw away the scorecard. Take the scorecard that you've been following and the paradigm that you've been following with it and just say, here, Jesus, here. I don't want this scorecard anymore. I just want to know your grace. I just want to know your love. I'm going to stop doing, and I'm going to start leaning into you and your love for me. Imagine life where you see all your troubles in the same light Paul saw his troubles here. Light and momentary. Imagine life where, where you view your treasures as nothing more to help you be generous, generous with the mission of the church, generous at times when we've got opportunities as a congregation, generous when you see someone in need or someone struck by poverty or someone going through a rough time. Imagine life that way because you feel secure. And because you feel secure in the love of God, you say, my hands are open. They're not clenched. My hands are wide open. So are my arms, and I can use them to grab hold of Jesus, and I can use them to dig into my own pockets and hand stuff out in love because Jesus first loved me, not because of anything I did, not because of my scorecard, but because Jesus already scored everything that we needed to have scored by dying on the cross and rising again. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for your son Jesus. You are an amazing God. Your faithful love is with us all the time. Lord, as we hear this 
this story of this young man who had his hands so tightly clenched around his worldly wealth and around his performance and his accomplishments and achievements. Help us to, by your spirit's power, just loosen our grip a little bit on those things. Help us instead to empty our hands so we, we can wrap them around you, Jesus, and your love for us. Lord, grace is a topsy-turvy concept. We don't naturally get it, but we do love it and we thank you for it. And now, Lord, help us to be secure in every step of our life because of your amazing grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.